The Women's International League for Peace and Freedom show the wake up call on WCOMLP, Chapel Hill and Carver 103.5 on your FM dial or live streaming at WCOMFM.org. I'm Eric Schwinzer here with our host, Lori Hoyt, and Emily O'Hare on the camera. Today, our special guest is Sally Robertson. Thanks, Eris. Uh, we're here again. On, it's cold out there today. It surprised me. I didn't expect it to be as cold as it was. And we're just delighted that Sally was able to come. Uh, Sally is with N.C. Warren. And um, N.C. Warren, what, how is, is it 20 or 30 years? 30 years this year. 30? Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, I remember when it gets started. That's how old I am. <laughs> so N.C. Warren has been one of our premier wonderful um, uh, energy and climate organizations, uh, advocates for for us folks for a long time. And so celebrating its 30th anniversary. So I'm very glad that Sally was able to come because this is all a lot going on about climate change. And uh, so we're going to be talking about what NC1 is trying to, to do about climate change. Is that mine? Yes. <laughs> we have some musical phone sounding off here. Okay, so Sally, welcome. Thank you. Yeah, now that we, we hope we have our phones turned off and <laughs> and our our, uh, our station turned on, and uh, so we're going to talk about NC Warren and what it's doing to protect us folks. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm glad you could come. Uh, so yeah, we, we bumped into Sally at the Carbrill Film Festival, which was wonderful, and uh, maybe next year we could give it a plug before it starts, because it's, it's an absolute treasure. Two days of uh, all kinds of independent film from five minutes to an hour or more, and uh, a lot of them really wonderful. Yeah, it was fun. Yeah, it was fun. It was fun. So I got some of the... It was some of the information that uh, NC Warren has a newsletter and um, and and also I had gotten this other letter from them in November and I'll just get us started with that it's will clean energy win the race versus climate chaos and it says we for several years we've been describing an accelerating race between the hopeful advances, and we're going to talk about those advances in clean energy and the ominous climate crisis, and that has become much more ominous. So the intensity of this race continues to mount. So that's what we're going to be talking about. We're in a, a, a race for survival, and I think so many don't realize that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um. We understate it all the time. Yeah. Um, I was just reading before I came over, uh, Bill McKibben, one of our best climate activists that we have, wrote an uh, essay in the uh, upcoming issue of The New Yorker um, on, oh. that I was, I, I'm part of the way through reading it, and he just lays out all of the trends and, you know, terrible statistics about um, extreme weather and uh, temperature increases, floods, droughts, fires, storms, um, and, you know, the tragedy of inaction uh, around climate policy from our leaders. Yeah, our leaders and our media. Mm -hmm. Our media will talk about these horrible fires that uh, are terrifying, people burning to death because uh, they're so, so like hurricane fires and the kind of intensity with fires we've not seen before. Uh, you know, and the floods, I mean, here in North Carolina, thank God we haven't had the fires that California and other places have had, but we sure have had our share, especially in the eastern part of this state, of, yeah. of flooding. And the media uh, is very reticent about mentioning the dread word climate yeah. crisis. You know, they, they'll describe the, the terrible flood, the terrible fire. Every once in a while, just lately, they, they slide that in. But uh, 
uh, until recently, and, and I'm sure in a lot of places it's still rarely given its due. Yeah, and, and still, amazingly, there's, there are quarters where it's completely denied. If you mention climate change, people will argue that it's not causing these things. But, um, but I think the trend is in the right direction. Like you said, the media are starting to gradually mention the link between climate change and some of these things we're seeing. Mm -hmm. um, but some of the things that I was reading about, for example, in that Bill McKibben essay, um, I hadn't even heard about, and I pay attention to these things. So really? we really aren't being told a lot of the um, effects that are already here. Yeah, and I think I saw in, in, in your uh, newsletter, uh, you know, people have talked about the UN report mm -hmm. <clears throat> saying that we have 12 years to try to make changes to kind of, I don't know if we, we can't really reverse it, but at least halt it somewhat or keep it from uh, going as fast as it's going, because that's been the other thing that I wish they would mention more, that this is happening so much faster yeah, yeah. than, than this, even the scientists were saying. Exactly, yeah. And so, I, and I think the, that report from the UN, which was a couple of months ago, the latest climate report they put out, was strong, stronger than what they put out before. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the way it got reported is what you said, that, that we have 12 years to fix it. And that's really not what they said. They, as you, you and I were talking about earlier, they said we have 12 years to get to where we need to be. Mm. And um, that's not really emphasized, is it? Right. And so that means that we have to really start uh, emissions downward in the next two or three years. The, the, strain, the weird thing that I think a lot of people don't realize is since some coal plants are being closed and we've got a lot of solar happening, people don't realize that emissions are fossil fuel emissions, carbon emissions are still going up. They're not going down. Yet. They're not even mm. going down yet. Mm. They're certainly not going down as much as they need to, but they're still going up. That Bill McKibben article said um, every year except for 2009, there's been an increase in annual fossil fuel emissions, and that was only the 2009 was only because we had that big economic downturn, and and so there were I suppose plants that weren't running as much as they had been, and things like that. But otherwise, it's just up, up, up. So it'd be a shame if we had to pray for economic downturns to save right. the planet. And the thing is that what we're always saying at NC Warren is the exact opposite. We, I know we have talked, last time you invited me on here, we talked about our NC Clean Path 2025 report where we show how North Carolina can get all of its power from renewables by 2030 and halfway there by 2025 and have it be better for the economy because there's a lot of jobs and a lot of money in renewable energy. The people that are making money from fossil fuels don't want to stop making money. But but the rest of us could, would be better off job-wise, economy-wise, with a green economy. Yeah, and I think in light of that um, clean path, um, um, maybe we could talk a little bit about the improvements just even recently with, with batteries. and Because that's, that's one of the big things with um, uh, solar is to be able to store that that power, right? And that had been one of the uh, not that long ago batteries were really expensive, but they have really come down a lot. Right. The the cost of solar has come down dramatically in yeah. the last ten years or so, and now batteries are doing the same thing. And both small scale batteries, like what you might have at your house, connected to your to your solar panels, and also you, what they call utility scale, really large scale batteries that would be attached to a solar farm out in the field. Um, so you're right that that's been the, the problem with renewables is what Duke Energy will always say when they're trying to fight back renewables is the sun doesn't shine all the time and the wind doesn't blow all the time. <laughs> but now that batteries are coming on so strong, that's a way to to store the sun when the sun's not shining, store the wind when the wind's not blowing, and then use it when it's needed. Um, and batteries have a lot of other benefits too um, for sort of maintaining um, the grid, a stable grid, mm -hmm. regulating frequency and things like that. 
um, that utilities pay a lot of money to do that, and it's something that batteries can be used for. So that it is a, a times of uh, uh, the temperature gets very hot, time, times that the need, need for electricity surges. Yeah, uh, it's it's not like a steady state thing in this times, or we get a cold spell, and so this with the, with much better battery storage that will be much more effective. Right, it can even out the demand. Right, that's it. Right. Even out the demand, that's a good way to put it. Yeah, yeah. And that's a, a benefit for a few reasons. Um, Duke Energy is still really bent on building a whole bunch of natural gas plants. It's natural gas from Pennsylvania, from fracking sites in Pennsylvania. So it's it's pretty dirty stuff, you know, where it's being drilled, and it's also dirty because it leaks along the way, um, and is. Uh, Natural gas is methane, so and methane is a worse climate gas than carbon dioxide, so it's leaking and caught probably is just as bad or worse for the climate than coal, and yet it's it's sold as this great clean fuel. So Duke wants to build a bunch of gas plants, and the, the what they're mostly used for is for those peak periods. They even call them peaker plants, and so. Um, if we could have these battery, a lot of solar and a lot of storage to handle those times of peak demand, then we wouldn't have the need for the gas plants that Duke wants to build. Yeah, and, and that's the other infuriating thing with the media, uh, that um, people hear so much about carbon, but they hear very little about methane. Yeah. Methane is carbon, too. It, what, but what bugs me the most is when they say that carbon emissions are down and they mean CO2, which isn't the case anyway, but car, uh, methane is CH4, so ah. it's, it's a carbon compound, too. Oh, I didn't know that. Um, okay. But, but it's, um, it behaves differently from carbon dioxide, and in the short term, it's, it's about 86 to 100 times worse in the short term than carbon dioxide. And enough of it. So, if it's all, if every molecule of it were burned, then perhaps it would be cleaner than coal. But a lot of it leaks. Enough of it leaks to make it really worse for the climate than coal. Yeah, I mean that, that's it. So many of these uh, things that they, uh, these pipelines, uh, for everything, uh, they they keep saying it's going to be such a benefit, and they don't talk about. It. They're all noted for leaking. And, and with, with uh, natural gas, hasn't there been some horrible explosions? Yes, yeah, there have. Uh, I'm trying to remember where, where uh, we have to somebody's house and all of a sudden half a neighborhood. Yeah, and even uh, there have been some explosions like that where there were abandoned gas wells. That, oh my gosh, um, yeah. And, and I think it might have been Boston, correct me if I'm wrong, but maybe Boston a few months ago had all sorts of explosions from gas pipelines that were leaking. Yeah, I so. couldn't, can't remember either, but I remember it was pretty scary. Yeah. Uh, to think that you're, you know, in your neighborhood and all of a sudden the whole neighborhood is it's, it's like uh, being in a war zone. Right. Only worse, those kind of explosions are like a direct hit. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we're trying to, the, um, we're working with other organizations to fight the Atlantic Coast Pipeline, mm -hmm. which is the pipeline that's um, <clears throat> proposed. I was told recently to, tell, to always call it the proposed Atlantic Coast Pipeline because it's not going to be built, but Duke Energy and Dominion Resources want to build it from Pennsylvania to bring the fret gas to North Carolina. And the permits have been approved, so Governor Cooper's administration approved the ones that they needed to approve. And but several of them along the route, either Virginia or elsewhere, are have been questioned by by the courts. So there's been a lot of delay, which is our friend, because the economics mm -hmm. of gas are really shifting, and mm -hmm. and and in favor of renewables. I mean, the economics of renewables are improving, and the economics of gas are becoming worse. So, if we can just keep that pipeline from being built until mm -hmm. it's obvious to everybody that gas is not the way to go, then uh, then hopefully we will have a chance. You guess it's not that re reasonable with all the talk they they've been having about 
all this reasonable gas. My One of my daughters lives in Graham in a 700 foot square house. It's an old house and it's heated by gas. And her bills are really, you know, you also have to pay electricity even if you have gas heat. And uh, it shocked me how, how, you know, how high her, her utility bills were. So I, I said, I thought gas was supposed to be a bargain. It's not a bargain mm -hmm. uh, at all. Yeah. So the, um, yeah, so our governor, and I think many of us who worked to get him elected, uh, are very disappointed that uh, he, he, what he signed the permit for it, he, get, for, for the Atlantic Coast Pipeline, and um, and I think we can talk about it at the end again. We always talk about, you know, you hear these big problems of what you can do about it, and mm -hmm. here in your newsletter, take action. Tell Governor Cooper to cancel the ACP, Atlantic Coast Pipeline, and to stop parroting Duke Energy's propaganda about the quote unquote need for gas as a quote bridge fuel uh, that this is is propaganda renewable energy with storage is cheaper can help all customers and could quickly replace all coal and gas in North Carolina mm -hmm. so uh, folks mm -hmm. and I'm saying that to me too <laughs> Lori you know uh, I've, I've called him already about the Atlantic mm -hmm. Coast Pipeline, but it doesn't hurt to call him often. Yeah. Because yes. it's such a disappointment. Yep. And he, you know, I think the legislature's given him some flack about some mitigation money and, you know, and, and I don't know how much politics, and, you know, I don't trust what they do either. But I just think that he's made a big mistake, and I think as people who have supported him and want to support uh, him, uh, you know, t to keep uh, ringing that phone and writing letters and yeah, I, he made a big statement recently, and I'm sorry I don't have all the details about um, the need for for climate action. Mm. And so his administration is intending to do something, but I think we should all let him know that, that the best thing he can do is to revoke those permits. So to that revoke the, them, absolutely. Yeah, so that the pipeline um, can't be built and we don't burn all of that gas. So until he does that, we're hoping that the the courts will... So there's, se there's several um, court actions uh, coming forth from different environmental groups, is that...? Yes, there was something just today that I um, got in my email, and I, um, I believe it was in Virginia, something that stopped the um, the laying of pipe in wetlands. That's, that's as close as I can get to <laughs> to what it said. But it was um, the person that sent it to me thought that it was a very good. Um, development because it's another delay like I was saying mm -hmm. if we can delay it long enough mm -hmm. so it's another delay and uh, just the thought that they were so what it stopped was them putting pipe in the bottom of rivers and wetlands yeah. and the thought that that was part of the plan to begin with is a little appalling but mm -hmm. uh, yeah I think Iris you've been working with that with tell us a bit about you no know? mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, uh, but I, I know one thing, haven't they been uh, t taking people's trees down uh, and it's not even definite that there's going to be the pipeline there? Yeah. Cutting, you know, they're, they're, they're so aggressive and, uh, and, you know, they, I guess, get some of the politicians in their pocket or, uh, but I don't know how that, that can be legal if it's still in discussion about a pipeline to go on, on people's property. Yeah. You know, everybody uh, talks about uh, private property being so sacred, yeah. but boy, when it comes to a big corporation wanting to mm -hmm. do something, all of a sudden your private property is not as sacred as, as you had hoped. Yes. And uh, I think uh, Iris and other uh, Raging Grannies and other friends went to a, a beautiful piece of land in Virginia, I think it was, or West Virginia, and uh, 
They're just trying to get support from people to protect their land. They cut down some real historic old yeah. trees. Yeah, it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. um, another, speaking of sacred land, um, reminded me that another of the court cases was NC Warren and about a dozen other organizations, including some from Eastern North Carolina where the pipeline's going to go, filed a Title VI civil rights complaint with the EPA. Oh. It was um, dismissed on a technicality, and, uh, but, but I think there are plans to, to revive it. Um, we looked at the data for uh, where the root of the pipeline and it disproportionately affects low income mm -hmm. and people of color, including Native Americans. A mm -hmm. lot of Native Americans, um, a large percentage of the North Carolina Native Americans live right along the pipeline route. And it looks like they did some fancy footwork with statistics to uh, when they had, when they certified that it was that was not the case. So, but, so we challenge that, and hopefully that will um, can come back up and be another part of the delay and event that eventually kills the proposed pipeline. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. that, that's interesting about uh, uh, Indians. Uh, they've been messed up. I mean, here we are, Thanksgiving, and in fact, there's been some interesting news items how um, uh, some teachers are getting um, um, were sensitized to telling a truer, truer story about the first Thanksgiving than, than we used to get, mm -hmm. and about giving uh, a more understanding to the, to the Indians and how they were treated, and and uh, it wasn't as benign as uh, you know the stories that we get, we get fed in school. So a lot of teachers are trying to change that and give a truer picture, but that this is a wonderful time to bring up about uh, uh, Native Americans have been in the forefront. Uh, and it, and it, is it coincidental that so many times, look at, look at the, uh, the, the South Dakota, uh, is it coincidental that all these pipelines seem to want to cross Indian land? I mean, so much of the, their land has been taken, and the little bit that they still have um, that we seem to need to take from them some more, or try yeah. to take it. Yeah. And uh, that mm -hmm. is just a compounding of injustice. Mm -hmm. And when you look at um, some of the areas that were flooded and have been repeatedly flooded by some of these hurricanes, like Robeson County is sort of ground zero uh -huh. for that too, and that's where a lot of the Lumbee Indians live, mm -hmm. and so they've been fighting this from various directions. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> so yeah, so there's all kinds of injustices, and and I know when this was first proposed at the Atlanta Coast Pipeline, I know a lot of people uh, were saying, you know, the the governor stood firm about offshore drilling, mm -hmm. and but that was mostly going to affect people with very big fancy beach homes. Not that we don't all love the ocean, but the people that were constituents that were mostly affected were those with a lot of money. And then, then he, he caved or gave in when it came to the pipeline, which is mostly going through poor um, communities mm -hmm. and communities of color and Native American communities yeah. where you know, people who are not going to be able to line politicians' pockets with the mm -hmm. campaign money very much, and that may be unfair, but I'd like to know why. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I never heard a good reason why he seemed to feel that this was so necessary, and if he was parroting uh, the propaganda about the need for gas as a bridge fuel, he's been, I'm sure, told that that's, that's a false um, story and um, so so I guess maybe we should just be hopeful and hope that enough pressure gets put on the governor. I think he's you know a good person. I'd like to hope he's a good person. Yeah, I think the pressure from Duke Energy in this state mm -hmm. is so enormous. 
Um, so Duke wants to build a pipeline, Duke wants to build the gas mm -hmm. plants, and if a politician in this state goes against that, or anything else Duke wants to do, it's, it can be very damaging. Mm. So behold that thought, we're going to come back to that about uh, the Duke Powers influence. We're going to take a station break, catch our breath. This is Will's Wake Up Call on WCOM LP, Chapel Hill and Carver, 103.5 FM. You can stream us live at WCOMFM.org. Thank you, Iris. Um, are there any uh, other announcements? I'm trying to think if there's anything. I know with the holidays coming up, there's still all kinds of things going on. Well, I'll just mention uh, last night at 5 o'clock, um, uh, Raging Grannies and some Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, a couple of us, uh, were out there protesting um, a Vusey cigarettes, which is an e-cigarette. It's one of the, the big sellers for Reynolds Tobacco, and we're doing that in support of farm labor. And that may seem a circuitous route, but it's how we got um, uh, the farm the farm laborers who were picking cucumbers, how we helped them by boycotting uh, the pickle, uh, Mount Olive pickles. And it took about seven years and finally they got a contract because they're the ones who do contract with, mm -hmm. with the farmers who then hire the workers. And the same with Reynolds Tobacco. They contract with the tobacco f farmers and have a lot of say about what kind of tobacco and you know, and certainly can have a lot of say about how the pickers, the workers are treated. So we've been having a monthly, hopefully around the country, uh, um, not boycotting, but protesting and trying to get public information out, people to understand. And I think right now, of course, an ally has been the, the government because more and more studies are showing how dangerous mm -hmm these are for young people and that a lot of their advertising mm -hmm. has been geared in the flavors, you know, cutesy flavors to appeal to uh, young people. So, um, so, but it's, they're still out there, the e-cigarettes, the, the e and even if they curtail their advertising, if it, if, which they may have to from government action, but they're still selling it to adults. So, so if you go to buy a, an e-cigarette, please talk to your, uh, where you buy it and tell them that you want them to get the message to Reynolds Tobacco that uh, we want the, the workers to be treated. That's hard work, picking tobacco. It's nasty work. And uh, so, so that's the only um, uh, uh, announcement I think that we have. So back to Duke Energy's influence um, and I have in your, on your uh, newsletter here, in a typical year, Duke Energy spends more than $80 million to influence its federal, state, and local government officials, the news media, civic leaders, and the public. So they do a lot of PR. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so, Sally, where are they giving this $80 million from? Well, if you listen to Duke, they will say that they're spending shareholder money. That they're taking that right out of the pockets of their shareholders, not out of their customers' pockets. But the, we are, uh, we've just filed um, together with um, Friends of the Earth a, um, a petition with the North Carolina Utilities Commission to investigate this and ban mm -hmm influence money coming, what we call influence money, coming out of customer rates. And the way we look at it, what we say in this filing is, everything comes ultimately from customer mm -hmm. money. Because um, Duke will say it comes from their profits. Their profits are used to pay their shareholders, that's true, but the profits come from customers. Mm -hmm. The way it works is that Duke recovers from us all the money they spend on staff, expenses, fuel, but when they build a power plant, they recover the cost of construction plus 10%, and that's where their profit comes from. So that's, um, 
bad also because that incentivizes them to keep building these power plants, mm -hmm. which is not good, but also... It's a big, big money maker for them. Yeah, it's a huge money maker for them. It is the money maker for them, and they can't... We, we call it in our filing an, an accounting fiction to say that that comes from shareholders mm -hmm. because the money comes out of your pocket and my pocket mm -hmm. and goes to Duke, and some of that money is used to pay the shareholders, which you know, they should be paid something, there should be some profit, but part of it is used for buying advertising, political contributions, a lot of con what they call charitable contributions to community groups, um, a lot of advertising. Um, and that's, Duke is a monopoly in North Carolina, mm -hmm. And their monopoly really doesn't need to advertise. They have no competition. <laughs> the reason they advertise is to keep up the, you know, the keep the public believing that they are green. To, yes. to keep, keep they have darling ads. <laughs> oh, there's yeah, there are solar panels. Heartwarming and, ads. <laughs> right, right, and they all have solar panels. And Duke has done minimal. They actually at the at the moment have three three percent of their power comes from renewables and they just had to present their 15-year plan for where they're going to get their energy. So in 15 years, 8% will come from renewables. Mm. And that's not that's, enough. That's a drop in the bucket. Right, it's a drop in the bucket, and it's not enough to solve our climate Considering problems. what we're facing. Yeah, and it's mm -hmm. not um, anywhere near what could be done. It's, in other words, they're not trying very hard. So, yeah. um, but, but they know that's what we want, and so that's what they put in the ads. So we're, we're paying through our money we pay to them on our electric bills, we're paying for advertising that we don't believe in and it's not in our interest. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a violation of our First Amendment rights mm -hmm. that um, we're being forced to pay for something we don't believe in. And especially with them being a monopoly, I understand like uh, Duke Power is in some other state or states where there's competition. And they are much more um, proactive with renewables where there's competition to keep mm -hmm. up with the competition. But here, yeah. you know, if they can spend $80 million and, and get uh, government officials, you know, bamboozled yeah. uh, uh, with this, with this uh, need for this gas as a bridge fuel, how, they're, how wonderful it is. Um, you know, they it's going. To, it's taking the public to in places like NC Warren and Friends of the Earth, and so NC Warren works with a lot of other um, um, environmental groups because mm -hmm. I think it's so important that you know each they all work together because it's it's such a crisis. Yeah. So I was glad to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, a lot of people are doing a lot of really good things, and where we have common ground with others, mm. we try to form alliances. Yeah, and it says in here that they, uh, the Duke's lawyers sent a letter uh, threatening a libel lawsuit. Uh, they particularly hated this um, uh, a diagram that N.C. Warren had about <laughs> where that money was going, but they were unable to counter N.C. Ward's evidence when under oath, yeah. so they backed off. Yeah. But I mean, this is the power tactics that they use, and I can see where maybe some politicians would be a little nervous that if they cross, you know, get them mad at them or cross, uh, cross, cross them in something that they want, that when it comes time for a campaign, they're going to put all the money into somebody else. And that's why I think it's so important, your lawsuit, to, to have that investigated. Where is that money going? Right, right. So what, what we want is for the Utilities Commission to not allow them to recover those kinds of expenses from customers. Yeah, because here, here they're saying that they, they will want to charge their people who pay uh, for their electricity for their cleanup, right? Haven't they been trying to get the public to pay for the mess they've made yeah. with coal ash? Yes, yes, that's another problem. I don't know I don't know if that's ever been settled. I actually am not completely up on that either, so yeah. I won't attempt to answer, but um, I think that 
the just this past year, they they have to go to the Utilities Commission periodically. When, whenever they want to raise their rates, they have to go to the Utilities Commission and show chapter and verse about why the rates need to be what they're asking. Mm -hmm. And so they have the coal ash cleanup costs in those mm -hmm. in that rate case. And I I'm, I kind of think that they did get most of that. I thought I thought too, but I'm not totally sure okay. either. But that's I mean that's how they are. They you know they have poor business practices. Let this uh, coal ash mess happen. Don't take care of the property the way they should. Yeah. And then when there's this is that affects mm -hmm. so many people, and then it's like uh, trying to stick it to the public. Yeah. And Another thing that they tried to get in the rate case and did not get is something that you may hear, hear them talk about their program called Power Forward, it, and it's also called Grid Modernization. I believe the figure is six billion dollars. No, I might have that wrong. That was the Atlantic Coast Pipeline. But there's a large, maybe it's thirty billion dollars that they want to spend to upgrade the grid. So the Duke owns the lines that bring it, the power to us, and they say that that they need modernization and they need to be upgraded and there needs to be like duplicate lines put in to to for resiliency if one goes down. But it's a they would get that um, that profit, that ten percent or some amount of profit mm -hmm. on that too. So it's sort of since they're getting pushback on their power plants, I think they see it as another profit center where they can spend all this money on the grid and and get profit on it, um, which is fine. We need a grid that's that's reliable for sure, but we don't need to spend that kind of money on it. And there's been a lot of opposition to that, so Good. that did not get and. And there's some degree to which they want to get that, uh, those expenses, they want to get it approved in advance that they can recover those expenses from mm -hmm. us. And I think that's what mm -hmm. stopped them from the commission from approving it. Um, in our Clean Path 2025 report that was written by Bill Powers, who's an um, electricity engineer, uh, he says that we don't need all of that modernization of the long distance transmission lines. He said we need a much smaller amount of um, upgrade to our local, what they call distribution lines, so it, within local areas, the, the grid within local areas, because his plan is based on localized solar. So solar where the power is being used, on, on the art center, on your house, um, on maybe um, vacant land that belongs to local governments but small systems rather than the large solar farms that are down east, far away from where the demand is. So his plan is based on local solar paired with battery storage. And since it would be mostly local, it would, the, the transmission that you would, the lines that you would need are mostly local lines, the distribution grid. But I think he said a billion dollars compared to their 30 billion. Um, just yeah. to upgrade. I've heard that it. before, that that uh, it's much safer in terms of all kinds of things, storms and and uh, terrorists, whatever, to, to not have it <clears throat> be these great big systems, to have it yeah. much more localized, have smaller systems, they're much easier to manage and less expensive. And I just think that there's so much misunderstanding and and it's really hard when a major corporation can put out its own version of things and it's very hard for NC Warner or other smaller groups to be able to counter mm -hmm. to, you know and that's where I want to come back to the, the the media I mean that's one thing I just uh, was reading in the be uh, beginning of this uh, newsletter um, disappointment with uh, WNC Radio mm -hmm. uh, that um, that they give all this propaganda of Dukes and yet they charge NC Warren to if they want to put an ad or counter mm -hmm. ideas they have to pay as an ad for it instead of that being part of the news. Right, right. It should be both. <laughs> it, it, it should be both. Yeah. And, and uh, 
So I, I just, when I read, I thought, well, this would have been good to have read before their big fundraiser. Maybe we can remember, remember for the next fundraiser, you know, call and say, well, when you, you know, give, give much more coverage to climate, and to environmental organizations that are countering uh, uh, Duke Powers' uh, stories, uh, then I'll consider giving you own told I don't have that much to give, but you know, at least make that point with yeah. them and even to write them and say that it would, um, it, that you're disappointed because I, I listen to, you know, WUNC a lot. I'm a radio person, um, but it's very disappointing. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, your, your show is far ahead of WNC in terms of reporting on climate. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they're not the only ones by any means, but they, uh, we have a program called Press the Press, where we have members who write letters to the editor and um, uh, generally, oh, that's great. generally push the media to do better. Mm -hmm. And a big um, point that we try to make is, is this thing about natural gas being a clean bridge fuel. And, and to get them to report instead about the methane and the methane leakage and how that's worse you know, methane is so mm -hmm. much worse than even carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. um, and that is the thing that WNC did report on once, but then they went back to having a report that talked about gas as clean. And so, you know, mm -hmm. if they reported on it once, they know it. And they should yeah. be including mm -hmm. that, they should be, be building on that in their future coverage of energy issues. Exactly. Because one time, uh, they say you have to repeat things so many times for it to sink in for mm -hmm. people. I do know that um, it seems to me that the news hour on uh, UNC TV, that they've been doing a little better lately and have uh, um, mentioned it a little bit more than they used to. They could still do better, but there's been some slight improvement there. Good. And they've had a, you know, a couple of real segments that really have gone into some depth with it a bit, but certainly not anywhere near what we need. Mm -hmm. And and I think what one of the things that the media could do is to make clear, when you hear that 12 years, it's not 12 years that we just have all this time. That means we've got to have a certain amount accomplished yes. by 12 years. And it's really um, a massive effort to turn the ship around in that amount of time. Um, oh, but, but things have been done quickly before. You think of the World War II mobilization and the space race and a really exciting development for me in the last, since the election is there's something now being pushed in by some of the new progressive uh, Congress people coming in called the Green New Deal. Oh. If you Google Green New Deal and Sunrise Movement, um, you'll find that the Sunrise Movement is a, is a youth-based uh, climate organization that's really going gangbusters. And it's a been, Green New Deal. I love the sound of that. Which is what it's what you might imagine that it's you know spending money on clean energy to you know that we create jobs and hopefully reverse the climate crisis um, and hopefully straighten out some of the injustices. They have language in there of, that we use also about a, a just transition, I, with, you know, transitioning from fossil fuels to clean energy, but doing it in a way that, that solves some of the other problems too about people who've been left out of the economic equation. So I'm very excited. The um, uh, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, the <laughs> young, youngest member of Congress when she gets um, inaugurated, uh, is a leader in this. And she's calling for Congress to establish a select committee to, to come up with a Green New Deal and implement it by, I think they have a deadline, January 2020. I think it's a really quick timeline, which it needs to be. It needs to be. And, and and what is it, the Sunrise Group? or the Sunrise Movement, I think it's called. Sunrise Movement. Wow, that is, that is exciting. We need some good news like that. Because you're right, when there's the political will, when it was World War II, it was amazing how quick they were making a, a plane every couple of days. I mean, they, they mobilized the whole country for yeah. a, a crisis. And, and these big ships, you know, I don't know how many of them, but they were knocking them out. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, and 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 there were then there were jobs for people. And I think I want to 
get back to that idea of jobs because and expense. People keep saying, oh, yeah, this sounds nice, but it would be so expensive. And the other thing, a lot of times, uh, sometimes unions are not as supportive as we would like them to be because they get uh, fooled with these promises of jobs building the pipeline. Mm -hmm. And I think we got to get clearer that those are, most of them, temporary jobs. And if you start having to put solar in all municipal buildings and in people's houses, those are, are would be well-paying jobs. That That's a skill. It, they can be trained quickly. We could have a mobilization in our community colleges. Yeah. And, and uh, this could be uh, so much more secure a future yeah. for, for jobs. Yeah. So one thing we can do is um, write to our Commerce people and ask them to sign on to this Green New Deal. I think there are only 15 or 20 that have signed on so far, but there's more every day. To the what? To the, the Green New oh, Deal. Oh, to the, to the Green New Deal, yeah. So I wrote a letter to David Price the other day, as, as, just as myself. N.C. Warren doesn't really do lobbying, but um, but I just feel strongly that he and others ought to step up and say, mm -hmm. okay, this is the time, and if you're on the right side, get on the right side, and let's help make this happen. So he hasn't made a decision yet, because it's still pretty new. He takes his time thinking about things, but, but boy, this is a good time good time to get, get him a, a deluge of letters. Okay, folks, of David Price, and, and the, you know, we should really write or call our senators, too. We may, you, you never know when Absolutely. when the light may dawn. I, I believe it was Senator Tillis that I heard a couple of semi-hopeful things about recently, and I can't remember the details, but mm -hmm. that, that he was starting to um, sit up and take notice and realize that this was something that needed to happen. And, uh, you know, a lot of Republicans are supporters of the military, and the military know knows that this has to happen. The Tidewater area in Virginia, where there's all those um, military bases, is yeah. very low-lying, and they're taking all sorts of steps because they know that the sea level is going to rise and they're going to be in big trouble. And here, a lot mm. of our military are right near the coast. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think you're right, from what I understand, the Pentagon is very aware about climate change. Uh, probably way ahead of uh, the president is just not just just not <laughs> just not in touch with a lot of reality uh, but I think um, I think more and more I'm hoping people will just go around him um, you know just like I think that somebody even the Republican congressmen are going to go around him on this whole Saudi Arabia uh, you know, horrible thing with Khashoggi, and um, that they're that they are gonna, I think, take some steps. At least it sounds like they might. They're making some noises like that, yeah. and certainly the Democrats should. So yeah, you know, maybe maybe our Congress can show that it's a real Congress and and um, that it can be effective. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they under, get understanding. Surely with all these um, calamities, nature calamities around the country, surely anybody in a right mind knows this is, this is strange. This is not, it, it, our hurricanes are not the way hurricanes used to be. Our fires are not the way fires used to be. Yeah. The God knows they were bad enough, but now they are mm -hmm. uh, more frequent, more intense. Yeah. So, yeah. So NC1 is a wonderful group. It's out there um, working with us. And, and I have see on here about hurricane relief uh, in partnership with trusted community organizations in Eastern North Carolina. Uh, we quickly established the Hurricane Florence Emergency Relief and Recovery Fund to support groups lacking the capacity to receive online donations but who are providing leadership and direct services to those bearing the brunt of economic and environmental uh, devastation. So that um, NC Warren is like a real powerhouse since then. it's, I think, you know, upping its effectiveness with all these um, alliances and working with these other groups. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think so. 
So we have a little bit of time left. Maybe we should just mention again about Clean Path. Okay. What that is all about. So I mentioned that we, uh, our engineer friend Bill Powers wrote a report um, this time last year mm -hmm. uh, showing how we can get off of fossil fuels for electricity. And then he just published an update to it, and we had a conference uh, last Saturday at the Friday Center um, where he came and spoke, and we had some other speakers. And we've organized action teams in seven counties, um, mm -hmm. the Triangle counties, and then also Forsyth County, Mecklenburg, and Buncombe counties, where um, NC Warren members and other members of other organizations are working together often with their local government officials to try to implement the plan. So for example, in our Orange County action team, we've been talking to the folks at Carborough about the new library that's going to be um, at, on Greensboro Street. Yeah. And we would really like to, it was actually um, Alderman uh, Randy Haven O'Donnell came mm. to us and said, I really want solar on that building. And yeah. we really wanted solar on that building too, so we've been working with them to hopefully make that happen. And help. Oh, excellent. And That's we've been great. trying to help local government folks um, just learn more about solar, how, how doable it is, and some um, ways to finance it that are perhaps you know more doable than they might have thought it was. Oh, that's great. So, so you form these action teams in, in seven counties. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful because it's so important to get to the, our local municipal people. Uh, it was really interesting to me that there was supposed to be a pipeline. My daughter, as I mentioned before, lives in Graham, and there was going to be a pipeline that went through Burlington and in that area. And from what I understand, that sometimes these uh, pipeline people, they get to the county commissioners secretly before people even know what's going on and get their uh, uh, agreement, you know, maybe you offered it to build a park, I don't know what all they, and, but uh, for some reason, they, they the, the commissioners in Alamance uh, and Chatham, I think, I'm not quite sure, but at least Alamance, uh, the people, uh, got to them first who were against the pipeline. Excellent. So that pipeline, unless it changes, I got my fingers crossed, that's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. and, and so they were able to get the cooperation from municipal uh, people because they got to them quick enough. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. Sometimes it, take, it really doesn't take as much as we think it might. Yeah. You know, it just takes maybe a few people coming up, coming forward with a little bit of information that the wasn't right there before. Time. Right, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah, because, they, you know, they, they, they live in those counties, they want it to be good too, and if you can get the right information in a timely way before papers are signed, that make it harder to, yeah. to change, yeah. So that, that was a real encouraging sign to me that, that uh, somehow um, the, a lot of these things can still be turned back, and right now it sounds like we're relying a lot on court action to to halt or delay, and maybe even to well, delay, and then maybe to eventually, hopefully, halt the Atlantic Coast Pipeline. And I guess the governor could have, you know, I guess he could change, now that he's got some more support with uh, uh, the legislature, it's, it's not quite as lopsided as it's been. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that uh, I really encourage, uh, well, I just want to say it one more time, please write or call your, our governor about uh, stopping the Atlantic Coast Pipeline. And um, that, that would, if we, if we use uh, NC Warren's clean path, it would save billions of dollars and help, help all the citizens. Uh, so, so I guess, and if people want to learn more about NC Warren, they could just Google it, I guess? Yeah, they could go to our website, which is just ncwarren.org, mm -hmm. and you can email me, which is sally, S-A-L-L-Y, at ncwarren.org, and if you have questions or want to join one of these action teams. Action groups. And so I should have said this, we're talking to, to Sally Robertson, I'm Lori Hoyt, <laughs> Emily O'Hare's on the camera, Ears. Schwitzer is on the board and our main technical person 
And uh, I, I've got to learn to mention that because sometimes people tune into the middle and they hear this interesting conversation, they have no idea who's talking. Uh, so uh, at least people, uh, when they see it on TV, they, I think they can, maybe they'll recognize us, I don't know. <laughs> and yes, Sally, thank you so oh, much for so coming. This is so interesting and so needed. Yeah, yeah thank you for inviting me and supporting NC Warren.